Since 2015, Pop Health Podcast has brought to you some of the best minds in healthcare, including leaders from government, not-for-profit, and investor-backed powerhouses, as they share successes, failures, and how our audience can move forward in today's constantly evolving healthcare world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode presented by 24-Hour Home Care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. I'm Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. In today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with Adamika Arthur, who is the founder of Health Tech for Medicaid. I was recently connected to Adamika through the California Medical Association as I learned of a healthcare IT slash Medicaid summit coming up in May, which is their second annual summit in Northern California that focuses on healthcare IT and Medicaid. Adamika shares a little bit about the mission and vision of her organization to ensure that the future of healthcare technology really benefits the Medicaid or in California, Medi-Cal population. You'll learn about Adamika's background, some of her inspiration and her story in today's episode. We hope you enjoy it. Feel free to check out other episodes of Pop Health Podcast by visiting us on pophealthpodcast.com, visiting us at our YouTube channel or listening to us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks everybody. Enjoy today's episode. Adamika, thanks so much for joining the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Gavin. Absolutely. So glad you made it, uh, folks, as we were uh, recording today. Uh, Adamika does uh, quite a bit of traveling from coast to coast, uh, and uh, there were some delays, but her and her team were awesome to easily adjust our schedules and make this work. So um, hopefully you are all settled uh, right now, Adamika. In my home office. So yes. <laughs> That is great. So before we get into what you're doing in the IT world, um, talk. Uh, we'd like to get to know our guest a little bit outside of the workplace. So could you talk about yourself, maybe like a fun fact, a hobby, something that might surprise the audience about you? Oh, wow. A fun fact. Well, I will say one interesting fact, I don't know how fun it is, um, is that I did not start drinking alcohol until I was 37 years old. Oh, wow. And so what at age 37 made you feel like, <laughs> hey, you know what, maybe I'll give this a shot? Um, it's probably not a great health consideration, but, um, so I, um, grew up in, uh, in a community and in a family that had a lot of alcoholics. And so, um, I literally had promised an uncle of mine who really struggled with alcoholism and then became a huge AA community advocate nationally, um, when I was eight that I would not drink. And so, um, he passed away a few years before I turned 37, um, and then I just realized that, like, I, I felt like I had um, the ability to, yeah, manage, you know, um, it wasn't, you know, I, I, I missed all the years of, like, peer pressure and all of that. And um, so for a long time, I guess, I guess a fun fact is for a long time that I was always a designated driver. And yes. Napa Valley, which is 43 miles from my house or whatever, was always, like, cheese country, not wine country. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy a, a great glass of champagne now and a couple a craft cocktail or two, but I've never been drunk. Is that a fun fact? <laughs> Good for you. And I'm sure for folks who are at least 37 or older uh, in our society, um, you're part, probably part of a small crew, I would say. Uh, <laughs> I'm who, can, sure. who can claim that? Um, I know what you mean. I'm usually the designated driver. We probably have similar uh, intake uh, styles, uh, periodically. Um, but yes, I know the DD situation and, uh, my colleagues who are listening to this will know what I mean, um, when we're doing company events. So, um, that's, that's a great fun fact. I noticed when we were talking and you're talking about your travels, you mentioned, uh, your little ones before we hear kind of about who you are today outside sure. of the workplace. Tell us about when you were little, where you grew up and ultimately how you got into healthcare. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, my dad's family has been there since 1853, so before Washington oh, wow. was even a state. So uh, they are part of the, what they call the Black Pioneers of that state. Um, so I grew up um, around lots of trees and lots of rain and lots of rivers, lakes, and uh, the ocean. So I'm very much a, a water person. Um, let's see, you wanted to know where I grew up and then what else did you want Yeah, so how did you, also, well, tell us like, oh, how did I guess I would healthcare? say. Yeah, but, but before you get there, usually yeah. what I like to hear from our guests is kind of the inspiration or like, you know, you, for example, you talked about your uncle and why you stayed away from the peer pressure of alcohol. Was there anybody or any influence in your life as you were growing up to kind of steer you towards the healthcare world? Yes, I come from a long line of nurses, right? My yeah. grandmother is a, who is 94 now, 
um, is a nurse. She was a GI nurse. And my mom um, was um, an occupational nurse and then um, kind of a um, in the early days of medical records, she used to run the medical department at Boeing. So my mom is a nurse oh. as well. Um, more of a corporate nurse than um, an on the floor nurse, but she did do her, she she did get her chops. Um, and that really led me to, uh, the, but the biggest influence I think for my career, so most people who know me know that I'm an epidemiologist by training. Um, and that was really spurred by um, the HIV and AIDS epidemic as a child. Um, you know, I'm almost 50. That was like really the, the time in, in the world um, where HIV and AIDS and, and communicable diseases in general around sexually transmitted infections were a very big um, thing. People were dying. They had no access to antiretroviral therapy. Um, and so it, it really fundamentally changed my perception and my thought process around um, I wanted to find a cure and to help. And that's essentially what how I started my career in public health. Okay, awesome. And so I know you grew up in Seattle, but you spent, uh, I believe, based on the homework, I didn't correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of your professional career in the East Bay, what uh, in California, Oakland area, uh, yeah. what or Northern California, what brought you down to California? Yeah, so I went to college in Atlanta. I okay. went to medical school in Boston. I did my training in Seattle. I worked for a couple of local public health departments and the Centers for Disease Control in the middle. And I got to California um, back in the early 2000s um, to the public health department in Alameda County. So that's what brought me to California. So did you hear about the opening and wanted to come out or how did they get you to, to make that move? Uh, there was a change in leadership. So when there is a change, I mean, the one thing you'll uh, learn about being a federal employee um, uh, is that there's a big difference. There was a huge difference, I'll say, between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. I was on, okay. I was, um, and so uh, while well, it was the first female to run the CDC. It was also very conservative. So for those of us, I was in the global aid service. Okay. Um, it was a very big pendulum shift between, you know, I was on one of the first teams to put antiretroviral therapy into the Caribbean, but yet soon later, we were not even really supposed to be passing out condoms. So it was just a very big political shift. Um, it's kind of interesting now as we talk about, you know, political shifts there's a lot of them and now there's like even political determinants of health which we didn't have to really think about oh. too much um many years ago but uh that that's what really made a difference and then at the time my husband and i wanted to um we both are from the west coast and so we wanted to move west we lived east a long time okay awesome and so i know you have kids as well one of the cool things uh you mentioned you and your husband moved out uh out west uh you're in the east bay i know one of the cool things I've learned about you is you like to do red eyes because you can <laughs> spend time with your kids and put them down. Yeah. And uh, I called you super mom off the air because sometimes I'm like, Hey babe, to my wife, I'm like, can you take care of the kids? I'm going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, kudos to you um, for that. So you spent, you, you gave us a little background, um, Seattle, East coast and back uh, as you moved back to California. So at what point were you looking at, this move into the not-for-profit IT access uh, world? Yeah, so um, I was in traditional public health in Alameda County for quite some time and then um, was a part of a team of people who um, helped shepherd in the 1115 waiver in 2005, which oh, brought yeah. $180 million of federal funding to California. It was the first state to expand Medicaid in the country. And uh, I was a fundamental um, part of that process. That brought me back to Alameda County after spending some time uh, running around the state um, to, you know, with about $40 million uh, to improve care in Alameda County, which was a very big grant back then. Yeah. Um, that essentially um, turned me into a hospital administrator because I really wanted to uh, make that money go someplace. And I knew the delivery system was going to be the best way for me to do that. And it was just serendipitous that um, Alameda County had just gotten a brand new hospital CEO. Uh, he was our 11th CEO in 12 years. Um, oh, wow. And he has brand new first time CEO and he had moved up from Texas. That was right last or the third. And I came in and worked on that program um, under Wright's leadership. And so um, that kicked off my hospital career. And so I worked in hospitals almost 14 years before starting health tech for Medicaid. 
And oh. starting Health Tech for Medicaid really had a lot to do with um, being a hospital leader and starting to see this wave of people coming in um, as innovators, as, as entrepreneurs. Um, what we thought of innovation at that time as hospital leaders was really electronic health records of which we were looking at meaningful use, which certainly has an IT component to it. Um, we had no idea or I had no idea that we were creating products and services to save people's lives. So the more curious I got about what was happening in Silicon Valley and why was there a disconnect between the delivery system and the innovator community, um, I realized that oftentimes people were developing products and services, but they were thinking nothing about those individuals who were on government programs. Yes. And that was a little scary to me because um, the majority of people on government programs, um, you know, that's how most people have a lifeline to care in this country at that time. Medicaid and Medicare combined was maybe like 110 million people. Uh, now that's a much, much, much higher number. Just on Medicaid alone is over 90 million. So, um, wow. so, so that was that's what started the fascination. It really came together by bringing together some fundamental entrepreneurs and other stakeholders to talk about what are some of the problems. We wrote a planning grant that was funded by the California Healthcare Foundation in 2018. And we launched at the National Association of State and Territor Territorial Medicaid Directors, NANDI, in uh, November of 2018. So I've been doing this ever since. Wow. So what, five and a half years? You are right. Strong. You, are, you are absolutely correct. So technology innovators, healthcare providers, policymakers and government officials, uh, Medicaid Advantage Care organizations, but most importantly, patients, patient advocates, um, investors, you know, we, um, that's we are that's our group of stakeholders. We we essentially are a convening body, and we do a lot of education, um, a tremendous amount of work around expanding access to digital tools and services for people on Medicaid. A lot of equitable, and inclusive design, um, and how we can enhance the quality of care through technology-driven interventions and data analysis. Um, a lot around how do we look at operational and inefficiencies or operational efficiencies, right? Yeah. To reduce costs. How do we strengthen partnerships between public and private partnerships to spur innovation? Um, and probably like uh, one of the things we're really looking at this year is really like, how do we scale kind of effective pilot programs and looking at innovation in certain communities? So, yeah. Can you give us, can you give us an example? You, you know, you talked about uh, like right now, you just said in certain communities. Mm -hmm. um, who in your lens, like who are some examples of the underserved communities or how would you explain what an underserved are examples community is? of underserved communities? Yeah. I mean, well, I'll just, I'll, maybe I'll break it down a little different way. There's 90 sure. million people on Medicaid across the U S right. There's no analogous, like a hom homogeneous kind of group or population per se. Yeah. Um, people can be on Medicaid, at, you know, from being kind of poor, um, or under, you know, a certain percentage of the federal poverty level that changes depending on if you're an expansion state or a non-expansion state. Um, foster you know, kids as an example. Hmm? Sorry. I was going to say foster kids as an example. Yep. Sure. So um, you have, you have populations of folks like individuals who are disabled. You have um, most children. Yeah. Like 50, over 50% 50 of the births in this country are Medicaid births. Right. So oh, like wow. it just kind of, I don't think people understand the geographic diversity of what Medicaid actually involves. 90% um, of the palliative care is paid for in this country by Medicaid. Um, so you've got wow. medi medi so you've got dual eligible individuals, you've got individuals who are disabled, individuals who are genetically unlucky or born with a conge congenital uh, defects. defects. You've got just general children, many adults, many working adults. They just don't make enough money and they're several hundred percent, you know, they're percentage under the federal poverty level so it's yeah it is literally in, in some cases it's a fourth of americans right yeah uh, no and that doesn't include the people who are caregiving for that population as well yeah no great points i didn't realize it was such a high percentage of the births um yeah. are most are kids 50 percent of medicaid is children yeah wow good reminder and for folks um i know in our show and you're a californian as well um most folks are aware that in California, you know, Medicaid is known as Medi-Cal. So um, you're doing work that's supporting all 50 states, I'm guessing, right? You're, you're so it, Medicaid is done 56 different ways in this country. So you've got all 50 states, <laughs> the district, and then the territories. So yes. that's It's funny because I would just naturally probably say 50 different ways, but really good point. It's 56 different ways. You got so, it. so tell us how you got connected recently with the California Medical Association or CMA. Yeah. So, I mean, um, look, that 
my involvement with the California Medical Association goes back pretty far, right? And um, being a hospital leader in the state um, for almost, you know, um, a decade and a half means that, you know, um, I've known about their advocacy and policy work for many years, their educational programs, and, you know, their ways in which that they are, um, you know, their physician leadership, um, their role at the intersection of technology, healthcare, and policy, and, and including how physicians in California um, can advocate and implement, you know, you know, things in their practices to improve care for Medicaid recipients, right? Um, and so I've, I've known of California Medical Association, participated in, um, but uh, David Ford and I have known each other for a long time. I used to be on the CalHIPSA board many years ago. What's um, that? What's the CalHIPSA board? Uh, so uh, in, in every state, they have these kind of data exchange platforms. So CalHIPSA was one that we previously had. It's all been um, rejiggered as, as you know, how health IT has done. Uh, we've had many different iterations of things over time. Okay. Um, and so I think I went to the inaugural conference last year and in going, um, you know, we, we were able to like co-conspire a dream of working collaboratively together. I think it's quite unique to have um, a small minority led um, nonprofit that has a really big outsized mission and a very large machine like um, CMA yeah. coming together. And I think that's also something we wanted to pattern match and show is that like, it's really important for um, public private partnerships to really like fuel this sort of dialogue and trust and convening. Um, and so we are really excited about our ability um, on the broad range of people who should attend, right? Like it could be valuable for clinicians, for healthcare providers, for tech entrepreneurs, for policymakers, for anyone who thinks about Medicaid and or Medi-Cal in this case, um, yeah. that are interested even in the integration of technology and healthcare. Um, and we're going to be talking a lot about um, best practices for tech implementation. Of course, we'll be talking about the big bad word of AI, right, where everyone wants yeah. to hear that. Um, but, I mean, California, um, more than ever right now, is working to expand coverage to underserved populations, right? Yes. And so health IT is, is like, pretty much our biggest scalable bet um, to ensure that we have equitable access to care. And, and, and that's what we wanted. We want to evoke thought leadership and have dialogue and communication about how we can do this better. How do we create that, that vision and make it a reality? Um, so last year was, you know, sold out. Um, and we really expect that we're going to do that again. Really can have lots of people from physician groups and IPAs, health plans. We'd love to see health information organizations like HIOs, um, come to this conference and and we're also you know bringing the voice of the voiceless too we will definitely have patients and individuals who, who live in the community um also be a part of our conference this year so we're very excited that's great and great to hear so folks want to learn more uh is there a website for the summit yeah. or yeah we have um uh it's it's really called the the health it and the safety net um uh, so it's called the Annual Health IT Summit. You can okay. um, find it online at HTTPS, you know, backslash, backslash, www.cma.docs. So C is in California, M is in medical, A is in association, docs as in doctors, D-O-C-S dot org, and then backslash health IT. Um, you also can subscribe to our newsletter, at Health um, Health Tech for Medicaid. We have a... Uh, website that's just wwwht 4 the number 4 m.org and you can sign up on our mailing list and we will um we have it in all of our newsletters you can also go to linkedin um under our page there or cma uh, cma's page so we've got it on social media you can certainly find us anywhere you could just email info at ht4 the number 4 m.org um we'll be glad to send you information about okay. the conference and yeah. I believe it's uh, uh, right outside SFO or the, the conference center attached yes. to Last Sacramento. year we were in Sacramento and this okay. year we are at the Grand Hyatt at SFO in San Francisco. So very close to the airport. It is May 7th and 8th with the main conference being on the 8th. The 7th is like the introduction evening um, reception. Uh, and we're really excited about the broad range of speakers that we have um, the um, really interesting points from community and payer, um, provider, 
Um, and there's also some sponsorship um, opportunities still available if folks are interested. Okay, awesome. I think the price was pretty good too. Uh, if I recall looking um, for uh, some of these conferences can be sky high nowadays. And this seems like a very reasonable price for what you guys yeah. were. Uh, we, um, we have always kept um, registration um, at a at a pretty pretty low rate per se. Um, if you are doing the early bird, um, oh, I think the discount deadline for early bird just passed. Um, okay. But so the, the regular attendee is, is 350. Uh, if you're a CMA member, you can go for 150. Um, and if you're in a, a part of another medical society, it's 150. We also have a, a coupon for Health Tech for Medicaid members. So just email us at info at ht4m.org and we'd be glad to give you, um, I think it's like $50 off. So 300 Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know uh, my colleague uh, at my day job is going to be attending and he's really looking forward to it. He's an IT uh, guru and he's hoping to learn a lot. Um, yeah. my, my day job is a provider in the Medicaid world and um, we're learning about uh, IT and wanting to grow in it. And I know Blonde California and beyond. So um, this is the first type of conference that I'm aware of that's like Medicaid and IT focused. <laughs> There's like healthcare and IT you yep. know, conferences, but yeah. not Medicaid IT that I'm aware of. So um, kudos uh, to Kevin at CMA for reaching out and for you as well for really creating this organization that is so uh, needed. Um, Adamika, I know you mentioned there's a, a newsletter uh, on your yeah. website. Are you guys active on social media too, or is really the newsletter the best way to follow? Uh, we are active on social media. You can actually see our newsletters on LinkedIn too. So we are on LinkedIn, we're on X, we are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, okay. um, and we're on TikTok, shockingly enough. So we we have a pretty broad <laughs> perspective of of content at Health Tech for Medicaid. Um, as you can imagine, with 90 million people being on Medicaid, you want to reach people um, in different modalities. So we're very easy to find. But our our newsletter is always published on LinkedIn. So you can actually don't even have to sign up on the mailing list. You can go right there and get access. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. cool. And I love how you, uh, you know, you're on TikTok too, because that's so important because it's a huge, uh, I mean, that's the, I, know, that the I will say stuff? I've never seen our TikTok content because <laughs> I am not on TikTok, but <laughs> like Health Tech for Medicaid's on TikTok. Yeah. That is, that is good. Um, yeah. I'm not a TikTok user, but my kids are. I know a lot of young adults are. My wife is. So um, good for you guys. I think you're, yeah. you're you're out there. We hope to like the integration of health IT into Medicaid involves so many components and strategies um, and kind of really designed to like tackle the unique challenges faced by people on Medicaid. And some of those we know about. We know about electronic health records. We know about health information exchanges, right? We know that telehealth got a, a huge uptick um, kind of during and um, in this moment in the pandemic. Um, but we often don't talk about data analytics and population health management. We don't talk sometimes about personal health records. Um, and so really, our goal is for folks to understand that the Medicaid population is very much in need of health IT to improve access to care, enhance quality of care, and achieve cost efficiencies. And so we're looking at, you know, we want productive tension between interoperability or data security or cybersecurity, which has been a huge issue yeah. Across the healthcare landscape and ecosystem right now with United Healthcare and others, but also to talk about things like the digital divide, right, um, where we don't really fully realize the benefits of health IT by not talking about what is digital literacy, right? What are the kind of federal and state Medicaid programs um, and and what they do? Yeah, that's great. You use the phrase "productive tension," which I think is. <laughs> I was talking to my mom yesterday, um, and. She she mentioned how someone used a phrase that was actually it actually helped vocalize what she was thinking, right? Okay. She was it had to do with harp playing, totally separate. But you mentioned productive tension, yeah. and that kind of vocalizes what I think a lot of different people. Uh, I don't want to go there because I'm I don't want to have to change, but change I need to change. We need to change, but it's hard. It's going to create tension with changing processes, but we got to do it like with help, like interoperability, interoperability. So uh, anyway, that's just my little ramble there that I love the phrase productive tension and I'm going to steal it <laughs> whenever we have to create a yeah. little. No, I mean, it's one of my, um, it's like, you know, we, we want, we want to have 
a dialogue and different perspectives at the table. It's the only way we're going to learn and actually save as many people's lives as possible is understanding the different vantage points that we have. And so I do think productive tension is the like the word that I use to describe that um, those catalytic conversations that allow for you to learn um, and allow for you to grow. Um, and that is either a personal or professional. So, yeah. That's great. Well, Adamika, thank you so much uh, for joining today after your long travel uh, weekend oh, from good. coast to coast. Uh, this is great. Um, I look forward to hearing about a successful conference. I know my colleague will be attending uh, to learn uh, from you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to reconnecting soon. Anything else, okay. Adamika, before we uh, let our audience go? No, I mean, we hope to see you in May. We're really looking forward to not only what happens at the conference, but most importantly, when we leave, right? We're really big on um, how can we all co-conspire and work better together. Love it. Well, thanks again, Adamika. Look forward to a great conference and more here in 2024 and beyond. Yes, thanks so much. Good to see you. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.